an unpopular topic in our days. And my suspicion is this, that it is because when you hear you're a sinner, what we really hear is, you're bad. You're bad. It's imprinted in our minds. Lots of talk about sin, very little grace. And that's how I grew up. You see, what is sin? Should we not talk about sin? Should we adhere to the demand of popularity and just shun sin and the confession and the absolution and the law totally out of our liturgy? Shall we do that? I don't think so. Because sin is still central. But so is grace. Martin Luther had a way of talking about sin that makes a whole lot, of lot more sense to me today. He reminds us that sin is much bigger than simple immorality. You look at his view of sin. He says that sin is missing the mark. It's all the ways we put ourselves in the place of God. We can encapsulate sin and the law by saying it's all the shoots in our life. We should be like this. We should be better. That's how we should be. And there's a whole big gap between our should be self and actually who we are, our real self, the should-be self, the Facebook self, and the real self, a huge gap. And usually no one but us knows just how short we fall from the glory of God. We know. And in those moments alone, when, we, when again we are beating ourselves up or trying to deny it or again making promises of self-improvement in those solitary moments, we know we fall short of the glory of God. We know how we should look like. And that's where the law comes in. The law just tells us precisely that. And in Martin Luther's time, he knew what it felt like for the law to convict him, to accuse him, to leave him with nowhere to rest. And if you want to know what really sparked the Protestant Reformation, it is the fact that feeling this way, Luther, read that passage from Romans. He was studying Romans and he realized, but... There is grace as well. Salvation is a gift. It's a gift. They are now justified by his grace as a gift. Let's look at the gospel. You see, he believed it to be true. And because he believed that God's grace is a gift, he no longer accepted the church, what the church had so long sold off, that you receive by works. There are three words that I want us to look at. The first word is if, two prepositions, if. The next word is because, and the next word is therefore. So if you can remember those three words, you remember today's sermon. If. You see, I grew up in an environment where the gospel was permeated by the little preposition if. The if-then 
proposition. If you follow all the rules in the Bible, God then will love you and you'll be happy. If you live up to that standard, then God will approve. There was always this standard. If you achieve that, those blessings are for you. And that be became a kind of an of a imprinted tattoo in my life and I think in many lives. If you lose 10 pounds, you will be worthy to be loved. If you get a facelift, people will love you more. If you get those marks, people will think better of you. If, if, and if. The rule of if and then leads to pride and despair. Pride on the one hand, if I do achieve those things, wow, I'm so proud of it. If I don't, I despair. When fulfilling the shoots is the only thing that determines our worthiness, we are either prideful about our ability to follow the rules compared to others, or we despair at our inability to perfectly do anything. Either way, we're in bondage. That's why the gospel is different. The gospel is not an if gospel. The gospel is a because gospel. Because, because, because. Because God is our creator and because we rebel against the idea of being created beings and insist on trying to be God for ourselves. And because God, because God will not play by our rules. And because in the fullness of time, when God had had quite enough of it all. He became human in Jesus Christ to show us who he really is because when God came to his own and we receive him not and because God would not be deterred, he went so far as to hang from a cross. We build and, did not e and we did not even lift a finger to condemn it. He said, forgive them, they know not what they do. Because Jesus defeated even death and the grave and he rose on the third day. And because we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that none of our success guarantees us. And none of our failures exclude us. Because God loves his broken creation. You and me. Because God came to save and not to judge. And this is the third word. Therefore, therefore, you are saved by grace. It's a gift, not by the works of the law. Not an if, but because God loved us so. Therefore, it's a gift that will set you free like nothing else in the world, like no shoot can ever do. What is this gospel then? This gospel of not if, but because and therefore. What is this gospel? This gospel is simply this, that God opened his heart and he invites us, come into my heart. And if I come into his heart, oh, what joy that filled my soul. It's a new day. This is what this communion 
is all about. God opening his heart. You can see the blood of Christ flowing. The body broken for you. And the invitation with open arms, come to me, all ye who are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's the reformation. Every Sunday, when we get together to do the communion and celebrate the communion, we do the confession. Sometimes we do it automatically. You don't even hear that. And after the confession, there's an absolution. And then we come to the table. Shall we get rid of the confession? No. It should crush us. And then it should put us back together. It should reform us. That is reformation. Amen.